What's going on everybody thank you so much for joining me here on my channel for another telescope review today we have got the sv bonnie 127 millimeter max sutov cassegrain now special thanks to sv bonnie for sending me this specific tester unit to try out for a couple of weeks it's been a lot of fun and i've had some really enjoyable experience with using this budget-friendly max sutov cassegrain telescope now let's dive right on into the specifications of this specific telescope. This is going to be very similar to something like Skywatcher or Celestron's Maxutovs. It's a 5 inch or 127 millimeter aperture, f11.8, sort of f12 at 1500 millimeters of focal length. This is, of course, more than enough to zoom in on the planets, get some high resolution lunar shots and observations. This telescope, though, does feature one single thing that is so unique to this specific model, and none of the competition has it, and that is a dual speed focuser. Right off the back here, you have a coarse adjustment and also a fine adjustment focuser knob. And let me tell you, for planetary imaging, that is the hotcakes, because that is exactly what you need to really dial in that planetary camera, especially if you're using something like a Barlow that will magnify the focal length. Any slight touch of the optical tube is, of course, going to make everything jiggle just a little bit. And having that really fine control allows you to be very gentle and do minimum disruption when you're trying to focus. This telescope is really lightweight, though, only weighing just a little bit over six pounds. This is more than enough to fit on most of the entry-level go-to systems, as well up to as high of a mount as you have sitting in your astrophotography gear. If you have something for an 8-inch or a 10-inch or what have you, these will, of course, adapt on those with no problem, as long as they take the same Vixen-style dovetail. But in my test, this thing also fits on something as small as a Celestron SLT and functions perfectly fine. So kudos for making this so lightweight and easy to adapt with a variety of different mounts. When you first take this telescope out of the box, though, you'll notice it has two different finder saddles on it. This is really nice for attaching different things like ASI Air accessories, different camera controls, finder scopes, things like that. When unboxing this telescope, it does come in a nice packed box with some nice pre-cut foam. Everything is really nicely wrapped together. The telescope comes saran wrapped, which is an interesting choice. I've not seen that before. But you can tell SV Bonnie takes a lot of measures to make sure that the telescope and its accessories are packed very well. You do, out of the box, get three different accessories. You get an inch and a quarter visual back, a two inch visual back, and a 0.68 photographic photo reducer, which is really nice for deep space astrophotography and will drop the focal length for you from F 11.8 down to f7.68. So this is a really nice photographic accessory, and it was a pleasant surprise to have this in the box. Normally, a telescope at this price point at $479 does not include such accessories like this. Normally, you have to purchase the visual backs and the focal reducers afterwards, which can cost an excess of another $150 or more, depending on the brands and the type of reducers and adapters that you want to purchase. So it's really nice that SV Bonnie included all these in the box for the user at such a budget-friendly price point. Now, the question is, who is this brand? We've seen this brand now on Amazon for a couple of years. And the question is, 
are their stuff any good? SV Bonnie has come onto the market and they basically take the stuff that is not proprietary in any way and they rebrand it under their own brand that can offer it at prices that really compete with a lot of the competitors out there. These focal reducers and visual backs just like this are the exact same ones that a Gina will sell you, that High Point Scientific will sell you, etc. But these cost a fair bit less amount of money, but they're still all metal construction. They still have the brass compression rings on the inside. There's really no reason to complain about these budget-friendly accessories. Now, some of their refractor telescopes are basically just rebranded versions of AstroTech optical tubes. They have the same ED glass in them. They're corrected quite well for color and distortion, at, even at the price point that they're offered at. And honestly, they give a lot of good value to the beginner. They've started venturing into deep space cameras, also cooled cameras, to compete with ZWO and QHY, to offer the same chip, just at a lower price point. This Maxutov telescope, though, is no exception to this. This telescope has no plastic except for the focus or not. Everything is aluminum and glass on this, including all of its accessories. The metal dust cap, the optical tube is all aluminum. It has a really nice sort of medium gray standard paint finish, which is really nice. We have these dovetail shoes, which are really nice. They include high quality, large hand knobs on them as well for easy grip under the dark skies. One thing I do really appreciate is this telescope has a much larger exit off the rear of the primary mirror. This is specifically helpful if you're using two inch accessories because that means you'll get bigger illumination of the field of view and less chance of vignetting on your CCD camera chips. Now let's get out under the night sky and let's test this out and see if it's as clear as my Nexar 127 SLT that's also in my telescope garage because that has been a telescope I've really enjoyed using and gives really good optical quality. And I'm really curious how this one stacks up. I've had the SV Bonnie 127 out now for about two and a half weeks, periodically through different nights, and I've done a bunch of different tests visually and also a few photographic as well. This telescope performs very, very similar to my Nexstar 127 SLT. Now, this is the direct competitor to this. But it's a good thing that it's pretty much on par because this one is a bit cheaper than the Celestron and Skywatcher equivalents. Now, typically with Maxutov Cassegrain designs similar to this one, they deliver a flat field, and that is done by the curvature of the meniscus lens at the front. It is not a flat corrector plate like a Schmidt Cassegrain or an ACF or an Edge HD. This is a curved focal plane, which means that it delivers a flat field correction right at the front of the optical tube before the light enters the system. This delivers high contrast views. It allows you to do photographic equipment. The only problem is with the Maxutov Cassegrain design, these optics are quite slow in terms of their respective competitors out there like the SCTs. Because SCTs typically are around F10. You can get modified, you know, RC telescopes that are F7, F8. These are real slow down to F12, sometimes even F15, depending on the size of the Maxutov that you pick to purchase. So that also yields a higher contrast view. A lot of people buy these Maxutov telescopes because they are specifically designed for high power lunar and planetary observing. These are also really good telescopes for splitting things like double stars, small planetary nebula, globular clusters, things that are smaller and require a little bit more magnification, or you just want a more narrower field of view. These are the type of telescopes you would choose for those types of objects. These are not going to be low power performers that are going to be able to deliver all of the Andromeda galaxy or the entire Orion Nebula complex. Even with the lowest magnification eyepiece I have, that still delivers 40 times magnification. Of course, if you ramp up all the way to the highest power eyepiece, you can get all the way up to about 375 times magnification. Now let's talk about the astrophotography potentials of this telescope. Of course, like I said, a lot of people purchase these for high power lunar and planetary, and that is where this telescope is going to excel with astrophotography. You, of course, put your planetary camera on the back. You dial up the focus on the moon or the planets of your choice. You can use Barlow's, and this is what it really, really excels at. It is super quick and easy to dial and focus, and also it cools off really quickly, too. Usually I have it out only about a half hour before I start imaging, and it's already thermally cooled to the ambient temperature because this telescope is not that big, and the primary mirror 
is certainly not that large either to be able to cool off. With the included 0.65 times reducer on this, you can drop this telescope from an f11.8 all the way down to an f7.68, which of course widens the field of view, brightens the image up quite a bit, and allows you to take wider targets than you would natively at f12. The only problem to this is you do need spacers that are not included in the box. We've talked about this before on my channel about back focus, and also countless times on forums and different astronomy websites, they mention this. Back focus is the distance between the focal reducer and your CCD camera chip to achieve full flatness of the field of view with that reducer. Unfortunately, right now I do not have a cooled deep space camera to be able to attach to the back of this for this demonstration and review, but I know a lot of you are going to. Now keep in mind, you can also just thread on your planetary camera like I did to the reducer. It is not very difficult. I just did it for fun, but it actually does allow you, even with the planetary camera, to take something like the wild duck cluster, which of course this is not a great photo of it, but hey, it shows you that even with the bare bones basic planetary camera, you can even do just some average deep sky imaging with it. So I can't imagine if you put a larger chip that's cooled on an equatorial mount, you probably can get very similar to refractor-like results out of this thing. When I have done visual observing with this telescope, I can say the star colors are beautiful. You get airy disks right off the bat on any given night, even if it's poor seeing, you still have nice airy disks around the stars. You get lots of contrast with the background. This makes it super nice to do double star observing. Also putting two inch eyepieces in here, it has no issues handling two inch eyepieces and the field of views and the lower magnification that you give it. The full moon is absolutely stunning in a Max Utah. The focus is crisp, and I could not recommend observing with this telescope. All in all, over the years, I have transitioned from visual astronomy to more astrophotography-oriented stuff. But this one actually kept me out for quite some time each night because I was like, well, I want to try it on something else, or I want to look at this. Or Now, of course, this is not the largest Maxutov that is available on the market. You can, of course, get up to seven inches and more, depending on the brand that you go with. Skywatcher and Celestron both offer a seven-inch variant. For SV Bonnie right now, five inches is the largest you can get in their Maxutov lineup. Now, when you're looking at their lineup and you're interested in the dual-speed focuser, this is the only one that is going to give you that feature. So you're going to have to go big or go home because the dual-speed focuser is only only available on this model. Over the course of time, telescopes, of course, require collimation. SCTs are famous for this, but Maxutovs are a little bit different. They have typically a glued secondary mirror, which means you can't really adjust the optical system the way you would a standard telescope. Typically, with something like the Skywatcher, you'll have these push-pull screws on the rear of the primary mirror, and you'll tilt the rear of the primary mirror just a little bit back and forth to achieve collimation. But SV Bonnie decided to do it a little bit differently where they included a threaded on cap on the secondary mirror that reveals the push and pull screws on the secondary mirror. So it kind of makes it almost act like a standard SCT telescope, but yet you have a curved meniscus of a Maxutov cast screen telescope. And I actually really like this approach from them. I think this adds a lot of ease to collimating these optics if they ever come out of position. And what you do is you just take your Allen wrench and you would loosen one, tighten the other, or vice versa. You'll do a star test, of course, when you're doing this to get collimation as perfect as you can with a high power eyepiece. And from there, you should have no issues with collimation for quite some time if it ever comes out of collimation. All in all, I do believe that this telescope is one that you should consider the next time you're looking for a Maxutov Cassegrain. Is it the largest of the Mac Cassegrains out there on the market? No. You can still go to Celestron or Skywatcher and get a 7-inch variant of this, which is, of course, a lot bigger and a lot heavier for a mount and an optical tube. But the 5-inch Mac is really versatile. It's very lightweight, very portable, but has the focal length that you need to do some really nice planetary and lunar astrophotography. You can, of course, attach the photographic reducer on the back to have even more versatility with deep sky imaging. And I expect that a lot of people are actually going to use this for deep sky astrophotography because of the native flat field. And if you can get this down to under f8, it's basically like having a smaller version of an RC or even a refractor in your hands because this is an extremely versatile telescope. Optical quality is as I expected it to be. Of course, I'm no optician. 
this is not going to be a telescope that we measure the wave of optics. These are mass-produced telescopes, so of course, take that with a grain of salt that some are, of course, going to be better than others. This particular unit, though, gave airy disks on all the stars that I observed, got really nice sharp images of the moon, the planets, some deep sky targets that I was able to find from my light-polluted backyard here, and overall, it is just a really good quality telescope at a really attractive price point. I think that instead of spending $600 plus dollars on the Skywatcher and the Celestron equivalents, I think this one should really be on the top of your list. If you've already got a go-to mount that it can handle, then by all means, grab this guy, enjoy the dual-speed focuser, which none of the other ones have out there, and get out under the night sky and enjoy yourself, because this guy will certainly be a good companion along the way. Thank you so much for joining. I'll see you next time. Clear skies and happy imaging.